take your Bibles and open them to the 15th chapter of the Gospel of John. John chapter 15. Now, sometimes we're asked, is it, uh, is it good for Christians to make resolutions? And uh, I say, yes, it is. It's a good thing to resolve certain things in our lives and uh, to set goals. In fact, if we're not setting, if you're not setting goals in your life, you're probably just staying the same or digressing. So setting goals, whether it is uh, regarding your health, uh, regarding your spiritual walk, uh, regarding your family, regarding your finances, uh, setting goals, making resolutions, uh, that's really good. The Bible talks about resolving to do good works. And so I'm all in on making resolutions, and I'm making some myself, just body, soul, and spirit. And, but the fact is, most of us know this, that by the end of January, <coughs> excuse me, we have broken most of our resolutions. Amen or oh me, <laughs> right? I, I mean, we just learned this lesson at Christmas once again, that you can't have your cake and eat it too if you want to stay lean. <laughs> you just can't. But bottom line is we make resolutions, we have good intentions, but we often fail. Several years ago, um, I personally, along with members of our family, began to do it a little differently. And that was to choose one word, just one word that would simplify and clarify life as we dreamed it, as we desired it in the coming year, that one thing in our lives that would, would uh, be the focus, if you will, that, that one thing or that one word that would express our desires and ambitions uh, for that year. For example, last year, my word was stronger. Now, you could pick a lot of different words. Uh, you could put uh, trust or faith or stewardship or or family, or uh, ministry, or you, you could pick a word that, that as you pray over it and think about it, I, I believe a word would kind of surface in your own mind as, as to what would be uh, the, the deepest desire of your heart. If, if this happened in your life, it would, it would somewhat cover everything because the resolves and all the rest come underneath the, 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 the motivation, the mindset, if you will, of that one word. And I believe because my word was stronger last year and I did some things in order to make sure that I was getting stronger. I believe I'm physically stronger. Uh, I, I know I am. I believe that, you know, I'm a stronger preacher. I'm stronger in the word of God. I'm stronger in my family. I'm stronger in a lot of different areas of my life because I picked one word and I stayed with it. In the 15th chapter of John, Jesus gave us a word, just one word, that if you will practice this principle in your life, if this word, and it's my word for 2015, this one word, if you will practice it, it will simplify your life and clarify what God can do with you to make sure that your life is abundant and full and fueled and overflowing, that your marriage, your relationships, your finances, you name it, certainly your spiritual walk will be better than ever before if you will live by this one word. You know, the Christian life is not the complicated thing that many of us have made it. Jesus reduced the Christian life down to this one word, the principle, the practice of this one word that we find in John chapter 15. Uh, Jesus repeats this word 15 times in this chapter. And I'm not gonna tell you what it is because it's gonna leap off the page. As you look at your Bible, please bring your Bibles in 2015. One of the things that I've done over the years is actually to get a new Bible uh, and, and mark it up through the year in my devotional time uh, or take your Bible with your notes that you have. Many of you, your Bible is such a close friend. Uh, it's an old friend and you keep it close by. But, but get your Bible, whether it's new or old, study it uh, each day and bring your Bible to church. You'll get so much more out of the messages if you will open God's Word Look at the verses, underscore them, mark them, make notes in your margins, make notes on a piece of paper, uh, and, and really get into the Word of God so that the Word of God will get into you. Now, I recognize that some of you are new to church, 
Maybe you're new to the Bible. You don't, when we make these references to turn to this passage or that scripture, uh, you're, you're not into that yet. You've never had an opportunity. Uh, you can grow into that, develop in that. There is, someone will share a Bible with you nearby. So if you're sitting by someone who doesn't have a Bible, offer to share with them. There's a Bible in the pew rack. Uh, and then we'll support you with screen notes uh, uh, with the Bible verses. But I, I'm asking you, church, if you, if you have a Bible and you love your Bible, you love God's Word, bring it to church. Don't rely on me and the screen notes, all right? Get your Bible, open it up to John chapter 15, and we're going to read this morning the first 11 verses. This is in the upper room. Jesus has gathered his disciples for the last time before the cross. It's a dark and terrible night before Jesus is betrayed, abandoned, uh, accused, falsely accused, crucified, his blood poured out. Uh, it's, It's all in an upper room on a dark night. And Jesus leaves his disciples with promises and this one word, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken unto you. Did you know the Bible is like a great bath, a shower for your soul, for your spirit? The cleansing power, the sanctifying work of God's spirit through his word, that's what Jesus is saying. You're clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers and branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. In other words, these branches, because they don't produce fruit, they are useless. They're they're set aside. Verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Do you believe that's in the Bible? Sure is. Answered prayer is a promise given to those who are abiding in Christ. And by this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. So prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I love you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandment and abide in his love. These things I've spoken unto you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full and running over. Does anybody have an idea what my one word is for 2015? It is abide. It's the one word. I'm putting it in the active tense, abiding, abiding in Christ. Now, I know that word may sound maybe somewhat nebulous and a little religious. Okay, what does that mean, abide, abide in Christ? It means to be connected like a, like a little branch. It's an illustration. Jesus is the vine. We are the branches. Believers are like branches in the one true vine. We have a vital living relationship with God through Jesus Christ. In this same passage, he talks a little later on about that we are the friends, his friends. It just blows me away to think that we are the friends of God through Christ. Jesus is our friend and he is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. The very first message I preached when I was 15 years old was from this very text when Jesus said, you are my friends. And I told my friends, and uh, as I was preaching that first message, how they could have a relationship with Jesus Christ, how they could know Christ. And just like a vine gives life to the branches and those branches produce fruit, so are we like believers are like branches who are in union and communion with Christ. And therefore, we produce spiritual fruit. Now, the reason that some have no fruit in their lives is because they have no, and have no evidence of spiritual life because they don't have life. I mean, I love these beautiful Christmas trees. I said, let's keep up the Christmas trees for a little while. Always 
hate taking down the Christmas tree. I love Christmas so much. But, you know, these trees back here, they're beautiful. They look the same this week as they looked last week. In fact, they look the same this week as they looked last year. <laughs> because they're not real trees. They're artificial trees. Now, they look good. They got ribbons. They got ornaments. They're beautifully green. They're lit up. But there's no life in these trees. And there's no life in a person apart from Christ. And if you just, you can, you can show up in church and you can have all the ornaments of religion and you, you can look good, but not have the life of Christ in you. You can be cut off from the life of Christ. So what, everything that I'm going to say to you this morning is predicated on first this vital union with Christ, that you are saved that you know that you're saved, that the life of God in Jesus Christ is living in you because you have trusted in him who died on the cross for your sins and rose again that you might have eternal life. We wonder about sometimes those people who come forward in church, they make a decision, maybe they're baptized, which every believer should be baptized, but and they show up for a while and they're active and active and active and then they disappear, sort of like all those people that you see at the gym right now that you didn't see last month and the, you can't find a parking lot at, the, at your workout facility, but hey, just wait a couple of weeks. There'll be many parking spaces available for you. And it happens in spiritual life as well. I mean, people make all these resolves to do certain things for God and yet they have no life. What did Jesus say in this verse? He said, without me, you can do something, nothing. There's no spiritual power no spiritual energy, life, without Christ. John would later say in his book, 1 John, speaking of those people who came in and went out, everybody wondered where they went, where they saved and lost their salvation, what happened to them? No, John says, they went out from us, for they were not truly of us. For had they been of us, they would have no doubt continued with us. But they went out from us that it might be made manifest that they were not at all of us. So let me drive home the point right now. Before you start trying to grind out some resolves and some, and some good works and some good deeds and some good fruit in your life, you must know Christ. Because when you know Christ, then and only then can there be real supernatural and spiritual fruit in your life. So to abide in Christ is to stay in Christ, is to dwell with him as a friend. It is to, to, to be with him, to remain in him is another word. Maybe you have a Bible that translates it, remain in me. That's what it's saying, stay in him, stay in his love, stay close to him, abide in Christ. And when you do, when you do, there will be fruit more fruit, and much fruit in your life. Imagine four baskets up here. One basket would have no fruit. Another basket would have fruit, some fruit. Another basket would have more fruit. And then there is much fruit. If you were to be honest with yourself, what would your basket look like? Would there be no fruit? Meaning that ultimately your life is going to be wasted? Would there be some fruit? That's good, it's a start. Would there be more fruit? That's better. Or would there be much fruit? My prayer for Preston Wood, my prayer for you individually, your family, is that we would bring forth much fruit to the glory of Jesus Christ, to the glory of the Father. That's the abundant life. That's the abundance that God has promised. That's the blessing that God has promised for every one of us who abide in him. First, uh, first Psalm talks about don't, don't take counsel with the ungodly, don't sit at the seat of the scornful, but plant your life by the waters and like a tree with producing living fruit, you will remain. John would later say, same disciple, he would say, may you prosper and be in hell even as your soul prospers. 
Don't you want your life to prosper and to bring forth much fruit? Say, yes. Tell me what that is, okay? Glad you ask. What is spiritual fruit? What are we talking about here? What is Jesus, what does Jesus mean when he says fruit, more fruit, and much fruit? Well, number one, spiritual fruit, spiritual fruit is introducing people to faith in Jesus Christ. Now, that's the obvious one, isn't it? That we reproduce spiritual fruit, that is new believers. That's what the church is called to do. If we don't evangelize, we will fossilize and die. So God has called us to be a living branch on the vine who is Christ himself, overseen by God the Father himself, that we are to produce fruit and more fruit and much, much fruit. I'm praying for the greatest spiritual harvest our church has ever known. All campuses, Dallas, Espanol, Plano, our North Campus. To those of you at our North Campus, the fields are white. People are moving northward at an unprecedented pace. We have a huge, massive opportunity and responsibility to bear fruit in that community for the glory of God. That's my prayer, but it's my prayer for myself to abide in Christ that as a result of my abiding in Christ, I will bring forth spiritual fruit that my influence and the impact of my life and, and, and my witness to others will bring forth spiritual fruit. Next week, we're going to see the spiritual fruit, the work of this church and so many of you who have brought people, invited people, influenced people, the spiritual fruit that remains because of the work of Christ. It's disappointing when you see a lot of Christians running around thinking, how do I do this? How do I do this? How do I bring people to Christ? How should I invite? I chicken out and all the rest. One word, abide in Christ. And if you're abiding in Christ, it doesn't mean you'll do less. It means you'll do more for him, but with greater power and energy and focus. I mean, I have a quiet time every day, every day of my life, most every day of my life. I, you know, I get up between 5.30 and 6 o'clock, and as soon as my feet hit the floor, I make me a cup of coffee, and then my knees hit the floor. And I get my Bible open, and I abide in Christ. I spend time alone with Christ. It's dark 30 sometime in there, and it's a wonderful, sweet fellowship. I look forward to it every day. I really do. And I, think it's, I know it's a key to spiritual growth in all of our lives, that you spend time away and alone with God on a daily basis. That's a discipline in your life. But it comes under the heading in my life of abiding. But I don't stay there all day. uh, uh, Don't get the idea that abiding is being passive and inactive. No, now we have the strength, the energy, the power to go do what God has called every one of us to do, and that is to be his witnesses. Paul spoke of this spiritual fruit. Uh, in uh, chapter 1 of the book of Romans. Paul was a missionary, of course, and he traveled the world seeking souls to bring people to Christ, fulfill the Great Commission. So he said, now I want you to be unaware to those in Rome that I often plan to come to you, that I might have some fruit among you also. So there's our work. Spiritual fruit is bringing people to Jesus. He said, uh, the, the writer of Proverbs said the same thing in Proverbs 11.30 about fruit. It says, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that wins souls is wise. So in your basket over the past months, how much fruit is there? No fruit? Fruit? More fruit? Much fruit. We all need to be honest with ourselves as to whether or not we are abiding in Christ and doing the one thing that he has called every disciple, every believer to do, and that is to share our faith. And the deeper you go into discipleship, the wider you will go in your witness. Secondly, spiritual fruit is Christian character. Christian character is the fruit that we're talking about. Romans 6 22, it speaks of the fruit unto 
holiness. There's a word you don't hear much today. We know God is holy. The Bible says we are to be holy as believers even as God is holy. Have you made it your ambition to perfect holiness? 2 Corinthians 7, 1, to perfect holiness in the fear of God, to keep growing in Christ-likeness and godliness in your life. If you're abiding in Christ, if you're staying close, you become to look and act more and more like him. When the apostles were arrested for preaching Christ, they observed, though they were unlearned and ignorant men, not trained in the rabbinical schools and so often, uh, but they were having such an impact, they arrested them, and they said they observed that they had been with who? Jesus. And when you spend time with Jesus, you're going to start looking and acting like Jesus more and more. Have you ever noticed how older couples start looking like each other? It could be a scary thought. I don't know. There are actually websites you can go to which demonstrate this. Also websites you can go to that people who resemble their dogs. But I, I have no comment on that. But if you stay around someone long enough, you pick up on their mannerisms and their mindset. And therefore, even, you know, you share some wrinkles through life experiences and, and you share some twinkles through life experiences and, 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 and you start looking alike, you smile alike, you're, you you start looking alike. And if you spend time with Jesus, you're going to start looking like him and acting like him. And what does Jesus look like? Galatians 5, and 23 is the fruit of the Spirit, which is really a composite character sketch of Jesus himself. And therefore, the Spirit produces and reproduces this fruit in us. What does Jesus look like? There's no physical picture of Jesus in the Bible. But here's what he looks like. Love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. That's Jesus. And the goal for every believer who's just a branch, we're just branches, Clinging to a vine, our goal is to become more and more like Jesus, to be Christ-like, to be a godly man, to be a Christ-like woman, a spirit-filled Christian. That's spiritual fruit. First book, Christian book, I think I ever read besides the Bible. Uh, eighth grade, someone, our youth ministry, I think, gave us all copies of the, of the old Christian book novel called In His Steps. Anybody ever read that book way back? And it's the story of a community uh, who decided to do everything, churches, community, politics, church, all of it. They decided to ask themselves the question that became very popular, bracelets and so on, several years ago, WWJD, what would Jesus do? And it's just a simple thing, really. And yet it's a biblical admonition. Peter tells us that as we follow Christ, we are to walk in his steps, in his steps. We're to follow Christ. What would Jesus do? And so it's a, it's a simple story, really, uh, about what happened when people started asking and responding to that question, what would Jesus make? And what would Jesus do? Now, one problem we all have with acting on that question is we can't do what Jesus would do, right? A lot of times we don't know what Jesus would do in a certain situation. But we all know who Jesus is if we know him, and we can be more and more like Jesus, and ultimately, I want it to be my aim and yours as well that every activity, every action, every ambition, that we would be more and more like Jesus. Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me and you. That's spiritual fruit. Christian character, more and more like Jesus every day. 
How do I do that? Not by grinding it out. Not by promising to do better. Without me, you can do what? It's so, some of you are so frustrated because you're trying to do this on your own. And you're not abiding in the vine. Get with Jesus. Stay with Jesus. Abide in him. And you'll start producing the fruit of your character, the character of Christ in you. Number three, spiritual fruit is also giving what we possess to the work of Christ. Spiritual fruit is giving. Romans 15, 28, Paul is receiving an offering. He's taking up a collection. So he's referring to the collection here. And he calls the collection fruit. Therefore, when I have performed this, that is taken the collection, and have sealed to them this fruit, the fruit of giving. Imagine that. Not just taking and piling more and more fruit into your own personal bucket, but giving what God gives you. He says the same thing, the great apostle in Philippians 4.17 not that I seek the gift. He said, I, I'm not after your money. But I seek the fruit that abounds to your credit. Or as it says there, that increases. The fruit that increases to your credit. Now just look at that. And, to, and explain it in any, any way other than what it says. If you give to the work of Christ, if you tithe and give offerings to the work of Jesus Christ as spiritual fruit, it will abound to your credit. It will increase your credit. Your credit with what? The credit with God, the blessings of God upon your life. Again, I don't know any other way. You say, are you preaching that prosperity gospel now? You know, give to get? No, not at all. But we, when we give, God blesses us in order that we might be a blessing to others. We give and then we get, it goes to our credit. Jesus talked about laying up treasures in heaven, right? Did Jesus talk about laying up treasures in heaven or not? All right. So he said, when you're laying it up, that goes to your credit when, when the rewards are going to be passed out. At the judgment seat of Christ, you're going to get credited for that. You may never see it this side of eternity, but you're going to see it one day. What you invested will be credited to you. And what you do see when God pours out blessings upon you and, and you can't outgive God, when God's blessings start coming to you, you give in order to get, in order to give again, in order to get some more in order to give again so that you've got not no fruit, not just some fruit, not even more fruit, but much spiritual fruit in your life. And I'm telling you, if you will give, you say, well, I can't afford to give. You can't afford not to give, especially if you're in financial trouble. Because giving is God's plan of economy for the believer. And it's spiritual fruit. I don't know if you've ever looked at it like this or not. You say, oh, well, okay, I get it. More talks about money. Well, remember, what I'm talking about is abiding in Christ. And if you abide in Christ, I dare you. If you abide in Christ, your walk with Christ grows. I dare you not to learn how to live and give because living and giving come in the same package. Life is made to give, and fruit is the result of your abiding in Christ. And fruit includes what you give. All right, the next thing. Got pretty quiet on that one. <laughs> the next thing is spiritual fruit is, are, is good works. Good works are spiritual fruit. Colossians 1.10 that you may walk worthy of the Lord. That's a great ambition. To walk worthy of the calling that you've been given. It doesn't mean that you are worth it. 
I mean, or that you are worthy, but it does mean you are worth it. That Christ gave this to you. He gave you this life. Therefore, you live worthy of his calling upon your life. I want to be worthy of the high calling of God in Jesus Christ upon my life. Fully pleasing to him. Oh, yeah, that's an ambition. How? Being fruitful in every good work. Good works. You say, what are good works? The deeds that we do, the good things that we do in Jesus' name. Anything from a cup of cold water to someone who is thirsty to ministering to a child in the nursery to helping a hurting, broken person by caring and loving them and serving them in some way by visiting a hospital or a retirement home or caring and sharing your life with someone who needs you getting involved in the community. Christians shouldn't just huddle up in churches. We ought to be involved in our own homes. Good works begin at home. In our homes with our families, our good deeds in our community, with our neighbors, our neighborhoods. You can make a list, but I guarantee you, if you will do this one thing, if you will simplify it all, abide in Christ. There will be plenty of good things for you to do in his name that will be right in front of you. Because what does the Bible say about Jesus? Jesus went about doing good. Jesus went about doing good. And if Jesus is in me, he's going to walk around in me and use my hands, my feet, my heart, my eyes, my life to minister in love and, and compassion to people all around us, working at the pregnancy center, helping hurting people who are facing crisis in their lives. I could go on and on. This is why we want every member of Prestonwood to be a minister, to find a ministry in the church, related to the church, outside the church in Jesus' name, but find a ministry where you can faithfully serve God and produce spiritual fruit because good deeds, good works, that's spiritual fruit. Spiritual fruit. So how's it looking? No fruit, some fruit, more fruit, or much fruit. If you were to be absolutely honest, you know, you can't change it till you confront it, Right? If you're to be absolutely honest, what kind of basket do you have today? One final thing. Praising and thanking God. Worship is spiritual fruit. That's Hebrews 13, 15. Therefore, by him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Worship, singing and praising God with our lips, sure, our lives, but also our lips. This is why when you come to church, you don't, you don't need to stand there. But guys, you're the, you're the worst about this. Stand there with your hands in your pocket, you know, thinking about the cowboy games coming up. You know, let's get, you know, you got ADD squirrel. You know, you just, you get... You, you can't focus. But I, I want you to come in here and get your mind focused on what it ought to be focused on. And, and sometimes you don't feel like getting here. I want a cold morning. It'd be nice just to lay up and, and get in those covers and, and stay. But you got here today and you offered, I hope, the sacrifice of, of your lips of praise. In the Old Testament, they brought the sacrifice from the fields, the fruit from the fields. But the fruit, the spiritual fruit, is what we bring to worship God is the fruit of our lips, praising God. I challenge you, make sure that church attendance, the worship of Jesus Christ is first priority on your calendar. Don't get to every weekend service and flip a coin with you and your family deciding whether you're going to come or not. Are you kidding me? Oh, well, it's Sunday. Are we going to go to church? We're not going to go to church. Kids, what do you think? Mom, what do you think? Well, we got company this weekend. I don't think we can come. Flip a coin. Let's decide. Calendar it. 
If you have to write it on your calendar, put the worship of Jesus Christ first in your life. Worship him with God's people. I mean, your children should never have to ask you, mom, dad, are we going to church today? They ought to know the answer to that before they even ask it. I never had to ask my parents, are we going to church today? Because we were going. And that meant Sunday night too and Wednesday night and a bunch of other stuff. (laughs) We were going. Are you kidding me? Flipping a coin about whether you're going to come on Sunday? Figuring out whether you got something better to do, whether or not you're going to worship Jesus today? Come on, man. Get here. Worship. And that, and and why am I saying that? That's spiritual fruit. Spiritual fruit. That's what you offer to God. Get here. Get here early. Get here ready. Get your praise on. Get your worship up. And then you say, well, is that all you're talking about? One time a week? No, of course not. Your life, you're going to worship God. You're going to pray. It it ought to be natural. I'm not talking about forcing something. But it ought to be natural when something happens. You just say, well, praise God for that. Thank you, Jesus, for that. That's the fruit of your lips. It flows out of the fruit of your life, which is Christ living in you. One word. Abide in him. And much, much fruit is going to come from that in your life. It's God's promise. You'll influence people and bring them to Jesus. That's fruit. Um, You will do good deeds, good works in Jesus' name that will make a difference in people's life, in the life of your church and community. You will give good gifts and generous gifts and tithes and offerings to the Lord, and that's Spiritual fruit that will abound to your account, that will be credited to your account. You will offer the praise of your life and your worship. You'll be faithful in church. You know, I try to be faithful in two areas in my worship, in my chair and in my church. My chair is where I sit in the morning and have my quiet time with God. And my church offering the sacrifice of praise unto him. And why do we do this? Jesus tells us that the Father may be glorified, that Jesus will be magnified. Let that be the burning ambition. May every activity, may he have the preeminence. And I know in my own life, it's just like, you know, my life is like your life. We can just get away, get away, get away, get away a little bit, and things come between me and Jesus. And that's why you got to run back to him and get close again and just say, Lord, I give you my marriage. I give you my family. I give you my health. I give you the church. I give you the ministry. I just, I just draw a circle around that, and I stay there until in all things I pray that he will have the preeminence in my life for the glory of God that I may bear and bring much fruit for his glory, for the, for the fame of his name around the earth.